Okay, so I think we can start. I Meanwhile, let the others join. So a very good morning to all of you, all students, research scholars, faculties, and my dear friends, a very good morning to one and all. And welcome all of you, all engineers, all civil engineers, to this wonderful international online webinar series on the significance and prospects of civil engineering. So this series uh, is all about understanding the importance of civil engineering. What are the future aspects, pers I mean, uh, perspectives regarding civil engineering? What a student can uh, improve in their qualities by hearing the experiences of all our renowned speakers. So this is what this webinar intends. So to start with, we have our first speaker, our, uh, I mean, our very well, well-known uh, Dr. Murli Kumarakudi, sir. And thank you, sir, for uh, accepting our invitation and joining us for the seminar. So right now, I call upon Sneha. Sneha? Yes, ma'am. To give away the welcome address. Honorary guest, Dr. Murli Tumarukudi. Respected faculty coordinators, Dr. Anjali Gopakumar and Dr. Gautam Saring, sir. Other faculty coordinators and research scholars. And all my dear friends who have joined in this international webinar series, a very warm good morning to one and all. PIT School of Civil Engineering is conducting an international webinar series on the significance and prospects of civil engineering. And it gives me an immense pleasure to announce that this session has been carried out by none other than the UN Environment Program's Chief of Disaster Risk Reduction, Dr. Murli Tumarkudi. He has over 28 years of international experience in the field of environment and disaster management. He is an internationally renowned expert in disaster response and has been involved in post-disaster response and follow-up of almost all major disasters of 21st century, namely the Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami in 2004, Cyclone Nargis Myanmar 2008, Sichuan earthquake China 2008, Haiti earthquake, 2010, Pohoku Tsunami 2011, floods in Thailand 2011, and the latest flood in Kerala 2018 as well. He has completed assignments in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Gaza Strip, Liberia, Sudan, and Wanda, dealing with the environmental impacts of conflicts. Before joining the United Nations, he worked as an environmental advisor to the oil companies of Shell Group in Southeast Asia and Middle East. This big personality who has taken all major positions in this field is hailing from our God's own country, Kerala. He's a native of Bengola in Ernakulam. He obtained his BTEC degree from Mark Athanasius College of Engineering, Kodamangalam in Kerala in 1986. He obtained his MTech degree from Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, in 1988. He received his PhD from Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, in 1993. He has published several books and writes articles in leading Malayalam dailies occasionally. Also, he is a winner of Kerala Sahiti Academy Award 2018 for humorous literature. And post Kerala floods in 2018. He's been working hand by hand and has been a great help to the government of Kerala as well. Needless to say, his articles and literature is a great inspiration to all the environmentalists across the world. So, sir, on the behalf of the School of Civil Engineering, I'm heartily welcoming you, sir, to start the series. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sneha. And uh, before we start the talk from Murli, sir, I would like to pass few instructions for the webinar. So kindly, all the participants stay on mute while uh, the, uh, I mean, a resource person is talking. And uh, the video can be switched on or off based on the internet connectivity that you have. Any questions that you want to ask, kindly share it in the chat box. And if you want to interact personally, kindly raise your virtual hand. We shall call you and you can please interact with the resource person. Uh, in addition to that, we will be passing the feedback forms also. Kindly fill in the feedback forms because the names that you add in the feedback forms would be added in your e-certificate. So kindly make sure that you fill in the feedback forms and send it to us. Thank you. And welcome you, sir, once again. Thank you. Uh, good uh, morning to my friends in um, VIT uh, and also any others who may have joined uh, 
from the internet. Um, uh, I'm extremely delighted um, to talk to a group of civil engineers um, today. Uh, to be honest, I don't get to talk to a lot of civil engineers um, these days. I started my career as a civil engineer. I started studying civil engineering in 1981. And um, I, um, in my life, I have had very little time I was where I was working as a full-time as a civil engineer, but I will come to that later. But before that, I want to um, thank uh, the Bellur Institute of Technology School of Civil Engineering for organizing this event. I want to thank uh, Anjali, I want to thank Gautam, and also my good friend, and also from my colleagues, um, Dr. Sabuman, um, whom I know for last uh, 30 plus years. Um, so thank you. Today I was asked to speak about the future of um, future prospect of civil engineering graduates. And in doing so, naturally I'll have to speak about the future of civil engineering as I, I, as I see it. Now to do that, of course you have to talk about the past of civil engineering. So that, th those will be the three segments of my presentation. I'll talk a little bit about my past talk a little bit about um, the future and then about the prospects of the graduates itself. I don't know how much of the history of civil engineering or engineering or the various uh, topics which you study are being taught in VIT. Most institutions are actually not very good at teaching the history of the subject which we are um, studying. You know, they start from the fundamentals of engineering because that's how sort of engineers are trained to do. We are supposed to be very objective. We are supposed to be very quantitative and so on. But it is important for the new batch of civil engineers to understand the history of their profession and what people did to bring this profession to this um, level. I'll give you one simple example. When we do civil engineering, one of the topics which we uh, most people don't like is, is surveying. And I think we do four uh, courses of surveying. I, at least I did four courses of surveying. And surveying was something which was done by you know, a village assistant in the village. And you know, we were asked to take a chain and staff and <clears throat> go around the college ground and sometimes the public road, and we did not feel very nice because we thought it's almost demeaning, you know, for us engineers to be part of, uh, you know, to, to be still going around with chains and staffs. Now, I don't know how many of you have actually read this book called The, the Great Arc. The Great Arc is a book about surveying of India. When the British started having control over India after 1757, they wanted to find out how big India was. Obviously, you know, India was divided into you know, hundreds of small countries and kingdoms and this and that, um, you know, fiefdoms, and nobody had a modern record of the area, how big the country was. And the British were always systematic. So they wanted to impose tax and to impose tax, they wanted to know how big India was. So they asked somebody who had done some survey work in Canada and said, can you come to India and do survey of the, the British Empire in India? British Empire in India by then had extended all the way from you know, Madras to Bengal. Bengal is where they started, then Madras, then Delhi, and you know, many parts of India. So it was pretty huge. So this particular <coughs> surveyor actually said, oh, it's a very complicated work. It's bigger than what um, I have done in Canada, but it'll take about two years to complete the full survey of India. And it will cost about half a million pound. This is what he said. So that was a lot of money at that time. And that was a lot of time, but still, the governor general agreed to that proposal. And he was invited to come. 
and it of course took you know the theodolite which was used for that surveying has to be imported from england and that ship was captured by pirates so there is a lot of story about how long it took before the survey actually could be started but the survey started the survey started i think in 1802 or 1803 and the survey started in chennai it must be somewhere very close to your colleges i think it's um our corner but you can check that i will send you the details of the book and i think you should make a pilgrimage to this place where the surveying of india started and it took them one month to do the baseline measurement because that's much accuracy and precision they wanted and it took them six months to survey till Coimbatore. And the survey was not very easy because people did not understand surveying. So there was a resistance to surveying. Um, the, the British people who are on the survey got always bitten by mosquitoes and uh, had malaria and all those things. And because the surveyor, you know, knew it is going to take a long time he was actually traveling around with his family so every place he went he has to he had to establish a tent and the camp size you know grew slowly and in order to protect them they have to have an army and so on and so on it's fascinating that there was even a european closet which was carried on top of an elephant so that every place where they went you know the the person could actually go to toilet in the way which he was not comfortable with and the survey went on and on and on and the survey which expected to take just two years took 63 years before it was completed in 1865 that was the the first great triangulation survey of india 63 years and it is estimated that the British lost more people in doing survey of India than all the battles which they fought in India when the British were ruling India. And one of those chief surveys was um, Lord Everest, and in his name, the Mount Everest um, still stands. Now, the point I'm making is that something as boring as surveying <clears throat> but when you look at the history when you look at the struggle which our forefathers and you know our previous generation had to do that type of thing in india and this is one of the greatest surveys in the world then you start to connect with that topic then you find that subject fascinating i recommend all of you if you have not read the book to read read this book called the Great Arc, and I will send you the details of this book. I'll give you another example. <clears throat> another fascinating job of civil engineers was to do tunneling. So you had a mountain. In the past, people used to go over the hill and come down, and that took a lot of time, a lot of effort, and it would have saved a lot of time if you dug a tunnel through the hill. It's very logical. Any civil engineer would think that's a good idea. So they started doing tunneling. And it did save a lot of time and money for generations of people. India, as you know, the, the, the Konkan Railway, there are many tunnels. And each of them is saving time for people. I don't know how much of tunneling did you study. Or actually, have you gone to a, a site where tunneling is ongoing? Because tunneling takes a lot of time. You know, there is one tunnel which I read is about to open between Himachal and uh, on, on way to Ladakh, uh, which I was told is a nine kilometer long long tunnel. And I was told it took 20 years to build. So it takes really long time. I was in Kerala last year. Um, you know, during the lockdown period, and I went to visit one tunneling. And they 
make one meter per day. That's the type of progress you make in tunneling. It's very, very complicated um, because you are digging deep inside the mountain, the shortage of oxygen, there's accumulation of other gases. You have to use uh, diesel fuel generator, etc. So that accumulates, so all that has to come out. And then you are using explosives, then you collapse. And when explosives are used, all people have to come out. So there is a lot of complication in it. So the engineers thought it's a good idea to tunnel from two sides of a hill so that the, the time can be half. So if you are looking at a tunnel, which will take 20 years, then if you were to dig from both sides, then it will only take 10 years, for example. Bright idea. But as you start digging the tunnel inside the hill, what happens is that the surveying become very complicated because of the local interference of the hills and the metallic content um, in those hills. You may have studied this. And you, you know, we, we study all this in very basic civil engineering, but we don't understand how important it is. So when you, you know, bring two tunnels from two sides, the middle of the hill, they should meet at one point. Then only you know you can have road, you know, train, road, or water going through. But sometimes, because you are starting from two ends and you have no way to connect between the two, before if they don't meet, they end up slightly parallel to one another. <clears throat> and this has happened in many many places. And historically, the chief engineer was in charge of that tunneling, was supposed to take out his gun and shoot himself if this happened. So this was the level of pride our forefathers had in their profession. Just another uh, example of how much um, our forefathers have paid to bring up this profession. I'll give you just one last example before I'll go to the the current and the future. <clears throat> All of you, at least if you are in the third year and beyond, would know about pre-stressed concrete. Concrete was used by human civilization at least for 2,500 years. You know, there are elements of concrete in the Roman um, aqueducts. So it's, it's not a new set topic. Of course, they did not know the science of concrete. They did not know the compression strength, et cetera, at that time. But they knew it worked. And then time went on, and time went on, and people started to understand the science of that. And then came reinforced concrete. And then came this bright idea that if the concrete was stressed in advance, then the amount of reinforcement needed can be brought down significantly to half or even one fourth. And this worked perfectly in theory. Concrete is pre-stressed, so therefore it can take more time. Fantastic idea. But when this idea was actually initially proposed by an engineer, people all agreed in theory, but they were not willing to put that into practice. They were not willing to put a beam which was pre-stressed for a bridge or a culvert or even a building. They said that would be suicidal, that instead of using, let's say, two tons of iron, you, you are proposing one ton. And what happens if something, the theory didn't work, and so on. So the engineer who was in charge of this actually had to you know, completely fight against all the systems, all the existing systems, and put his own money up to show that, look, it worked, and then eventually, you know, it worked and then pre-stress concrete has now become a completely natural, useful um, tool in the civil engineer's armory. So this is the type of history which we have um, with us for civil engineering. Now it is in this context that we are coming uh, into civil engineering at this point of time. And now we have to see where civil engineering is going. Civil engineering, as you know, has many subdivisions. You know, you have 
water resources engineering, you have um, transportation engineering, you have environmental engineering, you have structural engineering, you have surveying, you have all sorts of things. So I wouldn't be able to tell you in every axis how things are going to grow. It is possible to, pre to predict and project, but it is, um, you know, we will not have enough time to discuss that. So I'll just discuss maybe two or three axes where um, what I think the future will be. You know, many people assume that predicting future is, is like astrology. You know, it's, it's, it's really not science. And um, it's all speculation. And this is not true. When we say in future, if someone asks, you know, will there be an earthquake in Chennai or a flood in Chennai or a cyclone in Chennai on a, on a given date, that type of prediction is still very difficult. But from the knowledge of science and the engineering we have, you know, we can predict many things. For example, I can predict that there will be an earthquake in Delhi at some point, because historically there have been earthquakes in Delhi. We know for sure that there'll be an earthquake in San Francisco, for sure. We can predict with a very high level of accuracy <clears throat> the population of a country in 10 years. And those of you who are interested in this type of thing, you may know that the world population, while it's appearing to be increasing, is about to reach a plateau. Because in many parts of the world, the total fertility rate is below 2.1, which is what is needed to maintain a society at least at the static level, and it has to be above 2.1 for the society to grow. Countries like Japan has reached below this level. That means Japan as a country is not going to grow in population. Countries like Greece, I was told, is in 1.1, which is much low. A state like Kerala, it's 1.5. So it's also not something which is going to grow. Things like that. So the point I'm making is that there's a lot of predictions which are possible. So therefore, let me come to civil engineering. You have seen, all of you have seen Corona virus and the lockdown which followed. So it is 100% certain that our concept of what a house is has fundamentally shifted. Anybody who is now building a house is thinking of three things, minimum. Number one, if there is a pandemic situation and there has to be a quarantine, how can I make my house safest? How can I probably have one room, one space in the house where it's much more convenient for a person to be in quarantine? So more or less self-contained, maybe a kitchenette. Of course, you know, attached bathroom and maybe a separate entrance, for example. So clearly people will think, think about it. People will think that children may have to continue to study from their homes. So a study space where you, you're lighting and it's not part you know it's not part of the middle of the house where you know, every other um, transaction is happening and therefore disturb the children that should not be the case so therefore children should have separate study spaces clearly that will be in people's mind thirdly people will think that home is also going to be a future place of work this is also where i may have to con continue my work or my children may have to continue my work, or continue their work. So therefore, there has to be a provision for office space. So it's not that probably instead of three rooms, there will be six rooms. But the way, depending upon your financial condition, how you will think about your house would completely be different post-corona. And that brings huge opportunities, huge challenges. You know, there are, you know, as soon as the lockdown is over, probably there will be, I don't know, a million houses which people want refitted to deal with the new reality of this. <clears throat> so 
Second point is about the, the construction technology which we are going to use. In India, unfortunately, the, the technology of construction have remained more or less stagnant for hundreds of years. You still have you know, people listing brick on their head or passing up you know, by hand. And this is not how construction is done, modern construction is done. The construction material have remained stagnant. We are still using concrete a lot, a lot more than what is needed and a lot more than what is uh, done in other places. So that's going to change. We are, and as I will come to this um, bit later, entering what we call the fourth industrial revolution. But even at this point of time, as, as an engineering community, as a civil engineering community, many of our activities are stuck even pre-industrial revolution period. The, the way we are building a house now probably is not very different from the way we built a house 1,000 years back. People are still using mud, pressed mud to build, to build houses. But that's changing. It is now possible to 3D print a house. So how much of 3D printing are we, are we learning? So future of civil engineering would have a huge impact on that. I'll give just one more axis, which is about transportation. The biggest change which you'll see in the next 20 years in transportation is that the vehicles will start to drive themselves, what they call autonomous vehicles. It's a car, a bus, a truck, and I was told recently that even a bike would drive itself. It will balance itself, but it also drive itself. Now the roads which you would need would be then very fundamentally different from the roads which we have now, because the important of, importance of signage would become absolutely critical. How do you give direction to this autonomous vehicle which has no physical eyes? It's working on logic. So it has to be completely modern, adequate, appropriate to the capacity of the vehicles. So transportation engineering will have to be very fundamentally be different. The actual number of vehicles on the road might come down. So you may actually need much less road capacity in future than what it is now. Because when the cars become autonomous, that you are not driving a car, people may not have as much interest in ownership of a car. So it will almost be like Uberization of private transport as well, that any time I want to go from place A to place B, I will look for a car and the car will appear wherever I want the car to appear. I take the car, I go to the place where I want to go. A private car typically is idle 95% of the time. So early morning, you go to work. It takes, I don't know, half an hour, at best one hour drive to work. Then it's lying in the car park till the time you go back. So another one hour per day. So out of 24 hours, your car is working for two hours. The weekend, slightly more, slightly less, but still no more than 10%. So 90% of the time your car is idle. Now, if your car can be programmed so that when you have reached office, the car can then go and do some taxi service, for example help someone who want to go to school, someone who want to go to supermarket and earn some money, actually you'll be interested. But eventually all the cars would be like that. The private ownership of cars will come down. So this is what is going to, and therefore the number of roads, uh, cars and the roads will come down and so on. <clears throat> so tremendous change is going to happen in the transportation engineering. And I'll give you th three very interesting type of civil engineering, which will have a lot of demand where probably you are not even thinking. Number one, as you know, in the last 50 years, you know, we have built lots and lots of apartment buildings. 
right across India. You know, it started in Mumbai, then Delhi, then Chennai. Now almost every other A, B, and even C class towns in India have apartment buildings. And civil engineers have greatly contributed to doing this. And now you may be hearing every year that buildings are collapsing in Mumbai. Buildings are collapsing in Chennai. Every year during monsoon season, you hear this report from Mumbai. And a dozen people dead here and a dozen people no, dead there and so on. So one industry which is going to grow extremely popular is demolition. How do you demolish? big buildings and when we had to demolish three buildings in kerala recently i don't know if you're following it we had to have international experts coming in you know we have i don't know 100 civil engineers in the country not even one knew how to demolish a building we all know how to build you know 50 story building but how do you demolish a 100 story building or 50 story building or a five story building we are if you want to demolish a building we are still you know getting some rope and the bulldozer and pulling down and pulling down and on people and killing more people so one industry is of demolition for last 5000 years we have been building dams small dams big dams bigger dams biggest dams but the world has changed for the better. And the world is now thinking of decommissioning of the dams. We have all these dams, and now we are trying to reduce the number of dams. We are trying to allow the river to flow. Some countries are saying rivers even have a natural right to flow. So you have no right, no right to go and intercede the flow. Most modern dams now have a system called fish ladder by which a fish from the downstream can go and climb upstream through the dam. You should Google it and find out if you have not seen it. Across the world, there is understanding that uh, there's no right to build a dam and cut off the flow completely. Instead, the river should be allowed to have a base flow or environmental flow. So changes are happening in the water sources, dam industry, and so on. That's a huge area called contaminated land management. It's a multi-billion dollar industry across Europe. This is going around the country, looking at land where historically something was done. A petrol station was there. A landfill was there. A workshop was there. And the all sort of, you know, or, or a pesticide storage was there. And all these places, chemicals have gone into the land and then into the groundwater. And that has reduced the quality of that land. Now, how do you recover the quality of that land and then put it back to proper use? This is the whole idea of contaminated site management, multi, multi-billion dollar industry, an area which need tremendous amount of expertise and an expertise which civil engineers are ideally fit to lead. It needs geology, it needs chemistry, it needs engineering, it needs project management. We have it all. And this is exactly what civil engineers do in other places. We don't even know about that such a profession exists. We have, I don't know how many, 100,000 petrol stations. We have, I don't know, a million store of you know fertilizer, pesticides, and chemicals. We have landfill in almost every city, uncontrolled dumping. In Europe, landfills are illegal from 2020. So you will not have a landfill in a city. You cannot have any more new landfills. But not only, old landfills are mostly now within heart of the town because at some point of time, it was outside the town and then the town grew, so it's now inside the town. And therefore, it's a very valuable real estate if the land could be reclaimed. But not only can reclaim the land, there are a lot of valuable things inside the landfill. Things which we used to discard in the past is of high value now, such as an old radio, old television, all the heavy metals which is possible inside that, which is a pollutant when it's down there, 
it's a resource if you have to take it up. So there is a new terminology called urban mining. People are actually paying to the cities to restore landfills so that they get whatever they can mine from that landfill. They get that land and that land then have a much higher value and suddenly the whole thing makes sense. A huge avenue for employment and future prospects for civil engineers, a profession which probably most of you never heard of. So the point I'm making is that the civil engineering not only had a glorious past, it also has a tremendous future and prospect, many of which we may not be aware, many of them may not be very logical, many of them may be, some of them may be even counterintuitive, but that's a fact. So if you are a civil engineer graduate today, and if you want to remain a civil engineer, of course, there are tremendous directions in which you can pursue your career, which has prospects. I just you know, gave three axes. You can take any other axis of civil engineering and project the future, and you will see something positive. Because the world is going to be a better place, a richer place, a healthier place. People are going to live longer. So in that context, to create a civilized working, living atmosphere and ambience, which is what civil engineering is all about, we will have a role to play. But I'm not one of them who insist that the civil engineering graduate should be only doing civil engineering for two reasons. First of all, in a country where people move professions, you know, a, a chemistry graduate become a, a civil service officer, a physics graduate become a forest officer. You know, there is nothing which prevent a civil engineer from taking up that higher profession as against any other profession. So, there is, you know, so we don't have to be sort of shy about becoming a, a civil servant or an you know, Indian forest service officer or, or something like that. I, I don't think we should be shy. I think civil engineering probably have the broadest base of any topic I have come across where you can build a structure on it. You now we study chemistry, we study physics, we study economics, we study project management, we study geology, we study strength of materials, we study air pollution, we study surveying, remote sensing, satellite image analysis. So, I mean, so the amount of foundational things which we have and the amount of things we can put on the top of it, we study five mathematics, we've studied four surveying. So you know, there is tremendous amount of access on which we can project ourselves. And all of that is something which we derive from our foundational civil engineering. So if you end up working full time in satellite image analysis, then you are still doing civil engineering. I'll give you one simple example of satellite image analysis. In Europe, Many people rent out their house, but claim that they have not rented out because they don't, they don't want to pay tax. So they are using drones to go around in winter to find which houses are emitting heat. So it's a heat analysis. And if you have heat coming from a house, then it's clear that that house has an occupant and not lying vacant. And then the municipality go down to the individual and say what you claimed is not correct and therefore you have to pay tax. And you know, clearly this is something which at an initial look, it's not civil engineering, but the skills which you learned in civil engineering, such as surveying, remote sensing, now drones would help you to do it. So any of these axes, if you project, it is all civil engineering. And I think you should be very proud in continuing to work in that domain. I'll make just one final point and then I will stop. In Kerala, as part of my commitment to the society, I do a lot of lectures on career management. And a lot of people come to ask me, you know, what profession has scope in future? That's a very typical question. You may have asked many people, you may have heard people asking this. 
And people ask this question, you know, does civil engineering have scope in future? One question, you know, that same ask about this disaster management, environmental engineering, you know, data science, all, all sort of questions. And the typical career advisor uh, who is very switched on to what's going around the world would say that, look, now is the time of the fourth industrial revolution. So that's going to be big data for data science, artificial intelligence, robotics. This is the topic of the future. So you have scope in robotics. You have scope in AI. You have scope in data science. That's where you should go. And young people and their parents, they don't know anything better. So they will end up going for this topic. And tremendous, and they flood the market and the employment market is not there and there's nothing they can do. And they, you know, end up, you know, doing trivial job as, I don't know, a bus conductor or a, you know, part-time super or something like that. Because people still have the fascination for government jobs. But I always say that it, in future, it's not important what you study, what every subject has scope. The more important thing is where you study, what type of networks you create in the place where you study. And that's where institutions like VIT have this tremendous, tremendous scope. I, I, I say this, I'm not saying this because I'm talking to VIT graduates. When I'm in Kerala, I tell people all the time that any, at any given time, you know, people, let's say, in the hierarchy of courses, someone would get a, a course which is not much valued. I, I don't know what's the current hierarchy um, of courses. You know, someone is not getting computer science or something, and they'll say, oh, sir, I'm only getting this in VAT, but I'm getting computer science in you know, some institute. Where should I go? I say, go to VAT. Because what is important is the institute where you study. The type of peer group you have, the diversity of the group you have. If you have more people from more countries, that's the best. If you at least have a representation from across India, that's even better. The second point is the diversity of the curriculum which you are able to study. So if you have a fixed menu, like I studied civil engineering, 51 courses, I had choice on two. Just two out of 51 courses I could choose. And that is not good. If you have a choice, in my opinion, at least one third of the course, and that is a good setup. I understand VAT has a lot of opportunities for elective. The opportunity to learn languages, including English, is tremendous asset in your future. I understand VAT has that option. The opportunity to study in other places or study from other places, study online, travel, get connected, get networked. That's all important for your future. So, and this is regardless of whether you're a civil engineer or mechanical engineer or a science graduate. The way you network is what is going to determine your future. So civil engineers take pride in being a civil engineer. If you want to be a civil engineer, pursue the axis, look at the new avenues. If you want to do something other than civil engineer, engineering, just use civil engineering as a foundation, build on it. And you have the broadest foundation I can think of. But regardless of that, continue with your activity of networking because it is your network which is going to carry you into future. The final point I would make is that the world is changing. Fourth industrial revolution will fundamentally change the world. Artificial intelligence will fundamentally change the world. Many professions will become non-existent and many will become irrelevant. I all, already mentioned about autonomous vehicles. The, the job of a driver is already dead. Vehicles are already able to carry people without any human interference. There's a public transport in, Geneva, in Switzerland, but it's not very far from here. I have been in that public transport. It's like a minibus. It goes around the town, you stop, you stand at the bus stop, the bus comes, stops, you get in, you know, on your iPhone, you show where you want to go in an app, and then it, it takes you there in a fixed route. 
and there are taxis going around other parts of the world. And you think job of a driver very easily automated, but that's not the only job which will go. A job of a radiologist, for example, which is supposed to be very complicated, one of the most sought after PG professions in, in India now, that's going to give away to artificial intelligence. Civil engineering will also be changing. But what you have to do is to master the tools of artificial intelligence. It's not that you have to understand how machine learning works, that you don't have to need. You don't need. But in every axis of civil engineering, there will be impact of artificial intelligence. So you have to learn how artificial intelligence will interface with your profession. And that is the future. I would stop at this point and I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now uh, over to the participants. Students, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. This is an interaction session. You can unmute and please ask. Students? Please introduce yourself and then kindly ask or share your uh, views. Hello? Yes, I am hearing somebody talk. Can you please speak up? Hello, my name is Ansif. Louder, yeah, please. Yeah, my name is Ansif. Yeah. Yes. I'm from Kerala. I'm just, uh, I just passed out in this year. So I would like to know about uh, the future of eco-friendly buildings, etc. The green buildings, constructions. So, thank you. The uh, green buildings has been um, a fashion um, and a passion in Kerala um, for at least thirty years, at least from the time of. Um, Larry Becker, who you know, whose original work is even 1950s, but you know, at least since 1980s, uh, it has had a tremendous offtake. But there are also other movements, such as the International Green Building Council. They came with their own standards on what's a green building, which is very different from the way uh, you know Laurie Baker. Um, you know, if you compare, there will be many similar elements, but you could have a a concrete building which is also green in the, in the IGBC uh, criteria. So there is another axis going in that. There's a third element which is coming from the climate change angle because of all the human activities which cause carbon emission, 23% is supposed to be kind of coming from construction and maintenance of buildings. So therefore, purely from a carbon angle, so I mean, if you don't take any other angle, there's an incentive to be the buildings to be more sustainable. I think in the UK, the, the time is called carbon neutral. So there's a pressure for that. In France, every new building which constructs should have their roofing as solar. And this is all going to be the future. So I have no doubt that the future people would look for buildings which are more efficient People are, which are energy neutral um, or at least energy efficient and if possible even energy neutral by producing some uh, from some energy. But I was also told, and I read this only two days back, that during the whole lockdown period, there's a tremendous amount of mental strength, a mental stress in people. They're stuck in their houses be it an apartment, be it an independent house. They cannot move out. They cannot go to a park. They cannot do the things which they took for granted in the past. And people who had at least some amount of greenery around them apparently are doing better. And it is expected that the whole domain of apartment construction house construction, this will now start to be factored in. That people need a space to relax. In a number of countries around the world, 
doctors are being advised to prescribe you know going and spending time with nature as a medicine which the government will pay the insurance will pay for people to go and spend time instead of taking a medicine so yes um, that domain is going only to grow we are nowhere near the potential thank you Uh, we have so, two questions yeah. sir so one from uh, i mean akshaya madhukula she is a second year civil engineering student so mm. her question is she wants to know the future of oceanic structures and underwater structures so sure. the ability of uh, you know people to um, uh, civil engineers to construct uh, structures underwater is um, is growing and has grown tremendously and that allows other part of engineering such as uh, petroleum engineers to go um, such as geologists to go deeper and deeper into the ocean and explore resources and this is of course going to continue when i started working in the oil industry that's 1988 the deepest offshore platforms and structures were constructed or anchored at 50 to 100 meters depth and now someone said deep offshore we are talking about a kilometer or more and people are exploring floating production storage operations fpso um massive massive structures and one fps so the floating production storage of of floating operation would cost you know 5 billion dollars to build and then they drill oil wells multiple of them and then produce so the demand for this type of things is going to increase um in future because as we a little bit run out of resources on shore as we start to protect our resources on shore a little bit more ocean will become the next frontier which it has already become but the structural limitation which people had to go into the deeper and deeper ocean the civil engineers will bridge it and therefore they will be able to explore more using the foundation which we create thank you thank you sir so we have a uh, few more questions sir so now uh, we have a question from nanda kumar he is actually a fourth year he has passed out now so his question is uh, can you please give an insight about what will be the future about waste management both solid as well as waste water management i think some of the best uh, waste management people are sitting in vit so you know i shouldn't be speaking too much but i can give you a perspective globally and then um, in and you i'm sure your teachers are able to um do a few more <clears throat> as i mentioned um, in europe they are trying to eliminate the term waste you know sabu myself you know we all studied that waste is a resource out of place and i am sure probably that's also being taught in vit so there is nothing really called waste but i understand what you mean by waste so the whole idea is that to minimize the amount of waste which we have number one by thinking of what will happen to anything when the useful life of that thing finish for example a ship what will you do to a ship so will you put anything which is harmful in a ship which even though it's not harmful while in its lifetime may become a liability some years down the line this is how they think and plan these days in the past this is not how it was done <clears throat> so for example asbestos was one material which is used across the world in large large quantities and asbestos we know for roofing but that's not only use of asbestos asbestos have at least 1000 non uses 1000 uses but now the world know asbestos is a very dangerous 
substance. So managing asbestos waste has become a <clears throat> multi-billion dollar industry in itself. So every building, old building, there no new asbestos to be used, number one. Old building has to be assessed. Is there asbestos present? If it is present, is it safe in the current condition? If the asbestos, that if a part of the building which has asbestos has to be demolished, then has to have a separate asbestos expert coming in, do an analysis, prepare an asbestos management plan before the building can be demolished. And when the asbestos, asbestos is actually demolished, there is a huge amount of procedure by which it is handled to the grave. So the entire asbestos industry, asbestos management industry, we are not even started in India. It will come. It is killing hundreds of people in India. We still have not understood it very well. What are the challenges? Where is asbestos sitting? How to monitor it? We don't know. So just give one example. The whole question of landfills, you know, as I said, in Europe, they're trying to close landfills. We are trying to open landfills. In most cities in India, what we have is a dump site. You know, you take a truckload of waste and dump somewhere, maybe in an empty area, maybe in an old quarry, maybe in a river, maybe in a lake. All those will change. As our per capita income increase, we will start to demand more quality of life. And this happens across the world. So our per capita income, income probably grows something like $10,000 per capita at a purchasing power parity. Societies will start to demand more and more quality of environment, of which waste management and solid and liquid are absolutely fundamental. And we are on that horizon, around that curve. So these areas would have good prospects in future, for sure. The key is that we are prepared. For example, asbestos, you know, how did, did we study about asbestos? What do we know about asbestos? How do we dispose of asbestos? Do we have facilities to dispose of asbestos? Does the community know asbestos is a problem? Mm -hmm. So there's an entire cycle of things which we have to do before waste management would become an issue. We also have to learn as a community, not as civil engineers, that living, urban living has an environmental cost. When you had independent houses, your household waste could be managed locally. But when you have an apartment block with 300, 500, 2000 apartments, the solid waste cannot be managed the way you managed an individual house. It will have a cost and you should be prepared to pay that cost. Our society is still not willing to pay that cost. Our society is still thinking that something is someone else will look after, and that someone else is nature. But the nature has a limitation. They cannot absorb the type of waste which every, you know, one house, it could. 1,000 house, it cannot. Now, so the nature pushed back. Nature pushed back as, you know, as malaria, as dengue fever, as stray dogs. So instead of spending money on waste management, you spend the same money in the hospitals. So as an individual, as a society, you are probably spending more money now because the waste is not managed than on waste management. Now the society has to understand this as well. But your question, as a civil engineer, this is clearly a domain where the work is going to be tremendously, tremendously increasing in the next 20 years. Thank you, sir. So we have a few more questions coming up. So we have Akil Nadar from third year. So he has asked, based on your perspective, how competitive is Indian construction market? Will it be practical to think of a startup after undergraduation? And what could be the challenges? So three parts of questions, sir. You know, Indian construction market um, yet is not very professional. This is um, problem number one. We do not have um, very skilled people doing 
construction labor job the training of construction labor job is not very good so the majority of people who are working in the construction industry majority of the people 90% i would say have no no training on anything related to construction they naturally have no training in engineering they have no training in the skill which they are doing such as mixing cement for example such as you know managing reinforcement bar such as fixing glass windows they are all end up in that industry and learn the way it was taught by their seniors and that's not how it should be taught now these are things which should be taught properly and majority of the people in the construction industry including the managers including the engineers have no idea about safety in western countries you are supposed to have one safety officer for every 20 construction labor but we have organization which has 20000 people working still have no safety officer no safety plan and as a result in kerala alone there are 700 death per year of people falling from height a lot of them during construction and there's no insurance support for them so the point i'm making is that there is tremendous lack of professionalism in all construction sector so a startup which leverage on this leverage on your knowledge would certainly have a potential now that potential is going to grow because we have hundreds of thousands of people who have returned to india from other countries during this lockdown because they lost their jobs and these people are working a lot of them were working in the construction sectors in other parts of the world such as middle east such as singapore such as malaysia such as indonesia and they have they are used to better for proper professional civil engineering approaches so if you can have professional workers proper and systematic approach to construction use modern technology for construction and use modern materials for construction that's the type of startup which will have an advantage it's not going to be easy the resistance is too high the cost would be higher because you are competing with people who do not value people's lives so instead of investing in people's safety they would pay 50000 rupees to somebody if they die if at all it's not going to be easy but that's the future thank you thank you sir uh, so next question sir by uh, giri uh, he is also a fourth year so he wants to know the future of steel industry and he's also asking a question which country or university is recommended to pursue ms in structural engineering he also has one more question uh, that is related to what are the rec- i mean what are the uh, developed uh, sorry that, what are the skills that has to be developed in the field of green building technology so three questions sir i yeah uh, thank you uh, i'm not sure if i understand the first question very clearly is it about the future of steel industry or future of steel structures giri giri can you please uh, justify giri you can mute and ask yourself i think we'll go to the next question ma'am yes um, uh, actually he, he might have meant steel structures only he is basically a structure oriented uh, this, this is what i thought yeah. because the you know the, because the future of steel industry is a you know very very different uh, and you know domain altogether not not really of civil engineering so if you look at the you know when i studied civil engineering 35 uh, 39 years back now i had a, a very nice teacher uh, called uh, anima teacher and she 
she taught us civil, uh, you know, steel structures. And I had not seen actually a steel structure, you know, they were, we were taught about riveting and, you know, I had not seen one, I had not seen a, a, a beam of, I don't know, an I beam or an L beam and all, all those things. I had, not, I had not seen any of these things. So we asked the teacher, you know, teacher how, and I think she had a master's from IIT Madras. And we asked her, you know, how much of her exposure was. And she was very honest and she said, you know, her own exposure to actual steel structures was not very high. And you know, other than in probably in industrial sites, you know, where a refinery is being built, um, there was not a lot of steel structures at that point of time. Unfortunately, the situation remained more or less the same even now. And this is also part of the problem which I mentioned before. The amount of automation in our industry is very limited. The amount of mechanization in our construction is very limited. The number of people who actually know how to work with the steel is very limited. So therefore, steel um, structures have not gained the type of popularity it should um, in India even now, which is unfortunate because we are still sticking onto concrete, which is an excellent building materials, 2,500 years of history. I think the all massive urbanization of Europe after the First World War was supported by concrete, but Europe has left concrete behind. It is it's not that there's no concrete in Europe, but the usage of that has come down dramatically and steel, glass, plastic, composite materials are all taking over. And this would change in our place also when professionalism come to our construction sector. So we need mechanization as a starting point. We need professional employees to support it. We need people are, who are willing to invest some marginal higher cost now for a long time maintainability. So we are subject to this condition, I expect steel to grow, but it is not going to be a rapid or dramatic. Steel could have a better role if the modularization increase, if pre-constructed houses become more common, then I expect steel, um, glass, um, aluminum, etc., would have more um, more chance. Uh, but I expect this to be about 10 years down the line in the, you know, coming down to the common market. Of course, in the higher end, you know, things, things might. The second question was that why, why it's a good institute to do a master's in structural engineering. Um, you know, there are so many, there are so many that uh, it's, it's not very easy for me to say. Um, you know, I would naturally say the best is probably, I don't know, MIT, you know, structural engineering department uh, in Massachusetts. But you no, know, I think the way you should calibrate is not so much the best in the world, you know, which um, may or may not be accessible to you, but is most appropriate for you based upon your grades, your references, your GMAT, TOEFL scores, etc., GRE TOEFL scores, etc., and also your financial conditions. And also, maybe the, the geographical location where you want to study and live. You know, many, many people actually don't want to go to a country which is very cold. Many people probably cannot go to a country which is very cold. Um, so based upon all this, you ought to find out. There are excellent institutes in India where you can do structural engineering. There are excellent institutes um, in, in Singapore, in, in Taiwan, in Japan. So uh, it's not a one answer. Uh, you ought to do a little bit more groundwork, choose for yourself. The final question was about, you know, how do we prepare for a green building work? I think the, the current situation in India is that if you do a 
a certification from the Indian Green Building Council, IGBC, then that sort of gives you um, the official endorsement to do green buildings and then thereafter follow up with getting certification and so on and so forth. To actually construct buildings green, you don't need any of this. You don't even need to be an engineer. You, know, you can just you know, think of logically and start to incorporate greening elements into it. If you are a civil engineer, naturally you'll be able to look at, to, uh, look at these things. But my recommendation would be that of course you do engineering, but you also look at the buildings which are done by other people, such as Laurie Baker, such as Habitat in Kerala. And I'm sure there are many architects in which are part of the world, the country you are coming from. Look at some of their work and see how green they are. Then study the IGBC green building course. I think it's for a one week course. You know, what exactly are they looking for in terms of water management, waste management, in terms of energy efficiency, local purchasing. So there are a lot of elements of this. And then you can start to incorporate. It's probably a good idea that you, you don't become a fundamentalist in green building, that you will say you will only design green buildings. No, whichever building you are designing, you try to incorporate some elements of greenness, of ecosystem, eco-friendliness. Then that help you um, help the environment and that help you to strengthen your own case um, when you're talking to a new client. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So four more questions, sir. So this question is asked by Annie Thomas. She is a pastor and she's from Kerala. So she's asking about the future of demolition engineering. And she's also asking what all co courses should be done as an eligibility criteria for the same. Yes. Um, you know, Absolutely, you know, if I, <laughs> I would say the future of civil engineering is in demolition. Um, no, I mean, if there are people who are professional about demolition, that would have very good scope. And when you say demolition, you don't have to do, <clears throat> think of only demolition. You know, one industry which is going to be of tremendous value in Kerala is about raising buildings and relocating buildings because climate change is coming. One third of Arnakulam would become, you know, Kulam, you know, would, would be inhabitable. Thousands of buildings which are in Arnakulam now <clears throat> will not be habitable in another 30 years. You can already see it. If you are from Arnakulam, you might actually know. In many parts of Arnakulam, old buildings get waterlogged every year. And what they are doing is that they are filling the foundation, the floor with concrete. So they raise the floor level. So much so that I know houses of my relatives where they cannot any longer put a fan in the house because the, the, the clearance between your height and the ceiling is gone. So if you raise the floor by three, meter, uh, three feet, then you only have two feet. And then if a you know, person stand there, if you have a fan, then it could create a problem. It's happening all the, always, but that will not be enough. You will not be able to manage water logging simply by raising the floor. You'll have to move the buildings. You, will you move it physically, lift it? You lift by two meters? You lift onto a stilt? Uh, I don't know if you have seen a building on stilt. That's very common in Assam, in Southeast Asia, um, where you know, water is a day-to-day -day reality. So think of an integrated thing that is about moving the house, it's about lifting the house, it's about demolishing the house. Not only a house, but structures. When we build houses in India, in Kerala in particular, we build assuming that this is forever, that this building is where I'm going to go, this is where I'm going to have my children, 
and they will grow up and then I will die and then their children will grow up there and so on. This is what we assume. So we build buildings so, so solid. This is not how the buildings are built in other countries. In other countries, buildings are built maybe to last 30, 40 years and then they demolish part of it, maybe all of it, maybe use the foundation, maybe use nothing and then they, then they rebuild it again. And you may think, oh, that's not possible in India. But the fact is that that's exactly what we are doing also. If, if you go to Kerala today, and if you look at the average age of the housing stock, an average age of the housing in Kerala now is less than 50 years. So every building which we built, almost 90% of the buildings which we built 100 years back is demolished. And rebuilt on because it was not convenient it was not big enough it was you know with different materials whatever and now we assume this is it this is going to be the case in 2100 no in another 50 years we would have demolished 50 percent of the buildings which is now so it's not only big apartment buildings even even those normal buildings which we now see are really modern now 50 years time they will look very silly and you will be having a lot of money and you want to demolish it. So therefore, the opportunity for demolition would only grow. And if you go into that line of business, I think that has opportunity. I think you should learn three things in this. Number one, you should learn about safety. So you should do a, a diploma or a certificate course from the National Examination Board on Occupational Health and Safety. It's called NIPOSH. It's a very highly valued, valued certification um, in the construction industry, wherever you go, especially in the Middle East. There's a one week course or two week course, which costs about 50,000 rupees. You can do it in many parts of Kerala. You can, there's also a six month diploma, which is even more valued which also improves your employability. You must absolutely have it. Demolition is going to kill more people than construction in future. Number two, you should learn about the act of demolition. Unfortunately, to the degree that I know, there is no course on demolition in India. I think it's high time that institutes like VIT did a course on demolition. I think you should consider creating a two week course in demolition. Initially offer it as a, uh, as a certificate course. And these days online course, I'm sure you'll get, you know, 1000 as a minimum people, but then eventually incorporate that into your curriculum. But if not, I think you may have to study abroad. And these days, maybe there's online courses on demolition available as well. So that's the second element you must study, the whole art of demolition. The third one you should study is about climate change. So how the climate is changing? What are the extreme events coming? And how do you reshape your buildings? How do you reform your buildings? How do you move your buildings? Where are you will have to move your buildings? How you, will you build your houses in Kutanad, which is getting flooded annually? Should we construct houses in Kutanad the way houses were built in, um, in Malaysia, for example, or in, or in Indonesia, where houses are built on stilts? So the, the first floor is actually open. You, people use it as a car park or children's play, playground, but when the water comes, that area is open and your house is still dry. This is how they manage for generations. Should we introduce that type of technology to our place? So if you study these three elements and get into this demolition, uh, refurbishment, um, clim you know, climate proofing sector, uh, you will have very good future. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. So uh, I'll be reading the rest of the questions. In between, I would request uh, Sneha. Sneha, you had some question. Could you please ask? Yes, ma'am. Sir, uh, regarding our Kerala floods, now Kerala is experiencing back-to-back -back floods from 2018, sir. Kerala has experienced heavy rainfall than this in the previous year, but we never experienced a flood situation. But now flood is happening in Kerala as well as in other places also and back to back. So what is the reason behind this, sir? Is it some infrastructure change or climate change or what is it it's causing? The Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it is you know, scientifically proven that the climate change would increase the intensity of rainfall, not necessarily the total quantity of rain falling in one place, but the intensity of rainfall, which means the amount of rain falling in a given duration of time would increase. This is one of the most, let's say, um, uncontested impacts of climate change. And this is clearly happening um, in Kerala and in other parts of the world. And flooding happens more because there is high intensity rainfall than the total rainfall. That's why even though the total rainfall itself in Kerala this year would be less than normal, you would you did end up having localized flooding events in Kerala. That's because of the intensity of rainfall, which is due to climate change, number one. Number two is that we built our apartments and houses and um, supermarkets and our airports without due regard to land use planning and hazard identification. So if you took the 2018 flood, which is the biggest flood in our memory, and if you mapped those areas, they are almost identical to the 1923 floods we had in Kerala. But in 1923, our population was probably one fourth of what is there now. So simply there are more people and there are for more houses. And therefore, if a flood happened, of course it, it would affect four times more people. But not only. In 1924 and 1923, we did not have a culture of building close to a river. If you look at River Peria, if you are familiar with those areas, so if you took the, the bottommost stretch of Peria, you know, starting from Malayatur all the way to Kodungalur, and then people will not build houses close to the river because the river always, every year, actually, the river used to flood before the dams came. And then the dams came, there was no more annual flooding, so people assumed that these areas are safe, and building next to the river became the most sought-after thing, the most valuable real estate in Kerala were waterfront properties, and this is not unusual. So in the absence of a hazard informed land use plan, we built our assets very close to water. That's the second reason why we have this flood. The 2018 floods were actually of a slightly lower degree than the flood we experienced in 1923. Add me to the sites where the flooding is marked in 1923 and the same location the flooding is marked in 2018. And the 2018 floods are actually lower, but it impacted a lot, lot more people because of this. Because we built more houses without being risk informed. That's clearly a second problem. The third problem, of course, is that what you mentioned is that we built not only in flood prone areas, but we built and constructed in a manner which create floods. So by obstructing local water flows, by building roads, by filling land, by filling paddy field, we created localized water logging. 
so the water the, the river cannot uh, the, the water cannot flow in the channels which it used to and therefore it flood so all the three combined is causing the series of back to back flood events in kerala it will only grow because climate change is also raising the the sea water level which means whatever water is flowing down cannot flow down with the same speed as it used to be so which means there will be a backlog of water flow which means the flooding will increase and that's why i said place like ernakulam and i'm sure it's the same case for chennai and many other places would have a lot of areas which are uninhabitable in next 50 years thank you thank you sir we have many questions further i shall be uh, reading few questions here the other questions uh, is it okay sir shall we communicate and uh, you can have a discussion like no. through mail or something uh, if they are interested yes, in so yes, we shall sir. share the details to the students so students kindly feel free like to have a discussion with sir later on so a couple of questions more so here i'm clubbing two questions one is asked by ansif he is uh, he has already passed out and then we have ridhiman he is a second year student so both of them want to know the future of uh, building information modeling bim thank you in india yes you know i once went to a uh, a city called incheon in 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 south korea you know this is supposed to be the the city of the future and the city was built to be a city of the future this is um, you know there uh, of course the city is still not fully habited it's probably only 20% of the buildings are occupied but every building is what we call an intelligent building and um, you know everything from you know electricity to internet everything and 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 the lights and you know when the washing machine will come on um, this all uh, has been automated um, the way the, the waste is being managed Every, everything is um, automated there so clearly that's future that's um, in india by and large we do not plan cities like that you know we our cities just grow organically so therefore creating a system whereby every house is connected by a chute to a tunnel through which the waste will then arrive at the central facility like the sewage and those things may take a lot of time but having more intelligent buildings would clearly happen very soon and you know it is probably already happening in um, upper class upper class housing system and more and more our materials in the house would become intelligent and as you know the new revolution of the internet of things come everything in your house would start to talk to everything else you know your treadmill will start to talk to your doctor maybe that you are not exercising enough or you are exercising too much you know, or your treadmill might talk to your fridge for example and say this guy or this lady only work for 10 minutes don't allow her to open the fridge and have an apple for example this is the way the future is um, going so a system which integrate these things would certainly have an opportunity and this would be this will be sort of by default and this will happen without even you were knowing it uh you know your your mobile phone would be linked to everything in your house and every, every, everything will be talking to everything else and then there will be a number of applications you know the fridge of ordering vegetable from your you know vegetable vendor on the street you know you you would not imagine that this will happen before the lockdown but now that the lockdown happened everyone went electronic all the payment bill electronic everybody has a google pay uh you know now if you are not at home your fridge can check as to whether there is enough milk or enough you know katrika or something and you know send a message to your you know vegetable vendor and then you know they can they, they can transact you can give a fixed amount of money to your fridge for weekly purchase so up to 500 rupees if you purchase you don't have to ask me something like that 
and also the building performance. So it's not just about consumption, it's also about building performance, you know, about, about the heat, about the cold, um, about the humidity, um, about, about the light um, for children to work. Um, so all this uh, would happen. So I think if someone is thinking of you know, doing something about a startup, integrating these things, clearly I can imagine that that would uh, have a lot of users. It's already there, meaning the, the opportunities are already there. Maybe only 1% of the household can understand or use it, but it will become a lot more common, a lot faster than what we think. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The next question is by Vishwa. He's again a fourth year student. So his question is, by integrating the new technology like robotics and artificial intelligence in civil engineering, won't the unskilled labor lose their job? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, you know, I, it's nine o'clock, so I would uh, take this as the last question. And then, um, you know, any yes. questions you have, please send it over and I'll see um, when and how I can respond to this. Yes. This is 100% um, true. So I do an entirely separate lecture about the future of work. In 2013, the Oxford Martin School came out with a study which said that 46% of the current jobs as we know now will not be existing in 2030. 46% of the jobs. And it's not that 46% of the workforce will lose their job. 46% of the categories of jobs, which we know now, you know, from accountants to cooks to construction labor to whatever. And it's even more likely that when you look at this 46% category, probably 70% of the people would lose their jobs by 2030. This is future. And this is not something which we can prevent by feeling sad for the people who would lose their jobs. So now, what are the possibilities? There are three. One is that the new industrial revolution would create new jobs. A job of a, a drone pilot did not exist 10 years back. It exists now. So there are many, many other jobs which will come online because of a job of a robot operator did not exist, will exist now. So there are many jobs which will come online. Almost every job would be modified by AI and robotics. A job of a civil engineer, a job of a doctor, a job of a teacher, job of an architect, job of an accountant, everything, everything. There will be no job which will not be touched by AI robotics. So everyone who is employed should become, a, should understand what AI is going to do to their job. Now you have the third and the largest pool of people who are going to lose their jobs. So they have the two options. One, they try to migrate to the sector where new jobs are created. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be very easy for a construction laborer to tomorrow become an AI expert. That's not easy. But there may be opportunity. Number two, everyone in their profession learn how they are going to be affected by AI, acquire new skills, and then try to hold on for a little bit more time in that. For example, people used to cut grass with sickles. You know, that job will be extinct. extinct. It will go into grass you know, trimmers. So maybe you have to learn how to buy one, how to operate one. And then you actually have a higher salary, less job, instead of working eight hours a day for five days to, to clear one plot of land, you may only spend two days with the support of an equipment. But you actually get the same amount of money you used to get in eight days. So people will have to learn to adapt. 
But unfortunately, there will still be a large number of people who will not have jobs in future. And it is expected that across the world, governments and societies will have to create a system whereby everyone will get an income from the government, regardless of whether they have job or no jobs. This is called universal basic income. And having got that money, then they can decide what to do. They may decide to study, they may decide to travel, they may decide to watch movies, they may decide to go on pilgrimage, whatever. But they will have, they'll have no jobs. Sadly, this is going to be the future. But you can also see it as a great future. That working is not very natural. Working is something which we created. Human beings are not built to work. You know, animals are not built to work. Animals live in very normal life. So is human being. Our great forefathers, 250,000 years, they never got up in the morning, took bath and went to work. They chose to do what they wanted to do, spend time with their family, have a good time, chase animals, and so on. And maybe that's a better way of life than having this ridiculous idea of every morning going to work or sit at home in front of a computer and work. So you don't have to necessarily see not having work as a bad thing. You can also see it as a very good thing, a very interesting future where you are spending time on what you are really passionate about, such as your, such as your family, such as your hobby, such as nature. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you for spending your valuable time with all of us and sharing your experience also, sir. Now I request Ragashri to give the felicitation talk. Ragashree? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. It's my immense pleasure to uh, propose the vote of thanks on behalf of the management, Dean of School of Civil Engineering, and the organizing committee of today's talk. I would like to thank the esteemed uh, guests of honor today, uh, Dr. Murli Thumrakuri. Sir, your valuable insights on the bygone era, the current happenings, the future of civil engineering, the impact this industry has on environment, the, the impact demolition has on environment, and the technical shift or the changes that pandemic will get into our lives in, in the future has surely enlightened us. Thank you so much, sir, for this wonderful session. And we look forward to have more of such sessions in the future. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot, Rajashri. Thanks a lot, sir. So we'll have a virtual photograph now. I request all the participants to kindly switch on your video, please. This will be a memory that we'll take. Just okay? a few minutes. Just thank yeah. you. Thanks a lot, all of you. Just switch it on. You need not worry in whatever condition you are. The main aim is, a, I mean, a united, uh, I mean, uh, effort. That's it. Thanks a lot, all of you. Yes, sir. Got okay. it, sir? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thanks Bye -bye. a lot, sir. Yeah. Bye, sir. And uh, all of you, this is our first webinar. We shall be meeting for the next webinar next to Thursday. So as you all know, it has been scheduled on every Thursday and only two Fridays are, are, sorry, are also been scheduled because uh, two of our resource person are from uh, Saudi Arabia. So they will be able to give us the talk only on Friday. So only those talks have been scheduled on Friday. The rest, all the talks are on uh, Thursday. So we uh, request all of you to again join back on next uh, Thursday, which is 10th of September. We'll be having uh, engineer Francis Suresh Balan, who will be giving us more information about entrepreneurship opportunities for civil engineering. So uh, see you then. Till then, bye. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. I got them, sir. Attendance is taken, no? I mean, sir, Vishwa sir, Okay, sir. No problem. And feedback also, they are, I think they are... Uh, yeah, they are already filled, yes. So no problem. So because if possible, the certificates for this webinar, we can proceed within a week or something. Yeah, right? sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes, sir.
Yes. Okay. So we will close it, ma'am. Ah, uh, so we both will stay. Let them. Uh... Yeah. Or should we close it and again come back? How is it? Close it, ma'am. Okay, sir. Thank we'll you. We'll meet later, ma'am. Fine. No problem. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all.